Um, I want to start by acknowledging the Wadarang people on whose lands that I live, work and play on. Um, and I guess, you know, the key thing for me at the moment is making sure we acknowledge the public debate that is ongoing as part of the lead up to the referendum, um, the toll that takes, the misinformation, the racism that we're hearing as well. Um, if you haven't already educated yourselves as much as you possibly can about the process itself, um, to be able to challenge the misinformation that's being spread out, I'd really strongly encourage you to do so. Um, there's uh, some great TikTok and Instagram videos out at the moment that can help with that. Um, one um, is by Braden Hill. Um, the tag on TikTok is Brado87. I think Britt will stick the link in the chat for us um, if you want to go and check that one out which I think is incredibly informative um, on a number of aspects of the referendum. So I'd encourage you to go and check that out if you haven't already. Um, Acknowledgement also to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who do join us today, um, brother boys, sister girls, um, all uh, um, acknowledgement there and acknowledge the difficulty that this conversation um, that the country is having um, presents. Um, wow, like we had the registrations for this session were overwhelming for us. Um, I know many are going to watch the recording, but to already have so many of you on here today um, willing to talk about trans and gender diverse inclusion in the workplace is kind of always gives me, uh, you know, goosebumps to see that people are actually actively interested in this. It's obviously important. It's important to me, but to see that others recognise that as well is fantastic. So thank you for coming along um, and being prepared to listen to me. I'm a little bit awkward today. I had a skin spot, a uh, sunspot removed yesterday. Um, I thought it might be a couple of stitches. It turned out a lot more and it's right at the base of my neck. Uh, so it's a very awkward position. So as I'm turning to slides, I apologise. I'm not a robot. Um, I'm just dealing with the, the pulling of stitches, um, but we'll make this work today anyway. Um, I think that's kind of, I just wanted to say, I've got Britt here with us today, who's going to be monitoring the chat. Some of you sent through some awesome questions that we will get to. Um, and if I forget, absolutely remind me at the end, more than happy to. But as we go along, um, I really encourage you to put your questions in the chat. Um, and Britt may either answer them if they're simple ones to answer via text. Um, or by direct message or may actually um, interrupt me and we'll um, address the question there and there. Um, Britt happens to be my partner, but also happens to be an expert in trans and gender diverse inclusion for, for young people. So um, also can bring their expertise to the session as well. Um, all right, I think that gets us under the way. Oh, if you do want to ask a question, but you're a little bit like uncomfortable with asking that publicly in the chat, you can direct message Britt too, um, and they can leave your name out of it when they ask the question. So feel free to engage in that way as well. Um, all right, let's kind of get started on some content. Um, I'm just going to get some slides up here. Um, hello also to those who are joining us on the recording. Um, great to have you um, listening in as well. Um, I wanna show you a little video. Some of you who have seen my um, sessions before may have seen this um, already. So apologize, apologies, but this video to me is just such a great demonstration. And this experience for me was such a great demonstration as to how we create inclusion for trans and gender diverse folks. That is me in that stretcher. Um, it was not an experience I expected to have third day into Gay Ski Week. Um, so Gay Ski Week is kind of a global tradition. And there's been a movement recently to make Gay Ski Week a little bit more inclusive as it uh, traditionally was for gay men to go skiing together. Um, and so last year, myself and Britt um, and pretty much 30 other gay men um, went skiing, <laughs> which, is, which is you got to start somewhere, right? Um, the third day, I absolutely um, overestimated my abilities um, and went on a run that I definitely didn't belong on as a 43-year-old and hit a tree. Um, I'm okay, clearly, and uh, but the tree did knock me out 
Um, I didn't come off, the tree came off much better than I did. And as I came to, the um, Mark was a guy that I had been skiing with for the three days and he was holding me still. They were worried that my neck or my back, that, you know, I'd done damage. They wanted to keep me still. And I remember the first ski patrol officer coming up. And now at this moment, I'm looking at the sky through the trees. I'm considering whether I'm dying right now. Um, perhaps I've broken my back. Turns out I barely had a bruise, but let's not, um, you know, unpick that. But I hear the ski patrol officer show up um, and they're talking and I don't know what they're talking about. I paid no attention to the, the medical or logistic details that they were talking about. But what I absolutely noticed was them talking about me using she, her pronouns. That was the thing that I remembered. And I said to Mark, Mark, I use they, them pronouns. Can you tell them? And he's looked at me. He's like, what, what? I'm like, remember we talked about it on the lift? And he's like, oh, yeah. So he yells out to the ski patrol officer, bro uses they, them pronouns. And the ski patrol officer just instantly said, oh, okay, sure, no worries, and started using they, them. Next ski patrol officer comes along using she, her pronouns, and I can hear the other one correct the second one um and so they're using they them pronouns and my name again I still have no recollection of what they were talking about medically or logistically but I knew that conversation the third one comes along as a real it had a real gruff voice um and started using she her pronouns and I heard them correct him and the um that third patrol officer said what what do you mean? I don't get it. And I said, they, them pronouns, just use Brie. And so he literally comes over, stands over the top of me. And this bit I do remember, um, well, what the hell is Brie still doing on the snow? Um, I didn't realise apparently an hour and a half had passed by the time they got me down to the medical centre. I get down to the medical centre and you can see the patrol officer was wearing the trans flag because I'd been skiing in the trans flag that day. And so they went that step further and it was like, this flag is going to make it down the bottom. Um, but in the hospital, the receptionist came up to me and had the form to collect my details. And by now I'm with it. Um, and she's asking for my name. She asked for my date of birth and then said um, gender identity. And I said, gender queer. She said pronouns. And I said, they, them. And she said, sorry for misgendering you earlier. Address. And she just moved on so seamlessly. And after that, I had a really inclusive experience there. The doctors were sometimes misgendering me, but you could tell they were trying and, and mostly they got it. I share that story because it demonstrates what we need to create inclusion in organisations, in workplaces, in healthcare settings as well, is that not only do we need our staff to have a level of awareness, not only do we need that education, but we also need our processes and policies to nudge the inclusion, to create the inclusion, because we can't rely on individuals to remember things that and experiences of people that aren't their own, that perhaps they don't have a lot of interaction with. You know, we give somebody a training um, on LGBTIQA plus inclusion, and then two years later, somebody might present to them um, as trans and they can't remember what they learned in that session. So we have to make sure that our processes, our policies and our systems create the environment for the inclusion and then that our people know what to do with that. And I know that's a, you know, kind of a customer service example that I've provided, but it's exactly the same when we've got trans and gender diverse employees within our organisation. We need to have the systems and the policies in place and set up that will create that inclusion for them that prevents us from kind of running down gender um, gender binary norms or heteronormativity and we'll talk about that in a second um so yes I use they them pronouns um but I can see many of you also use they them pronouns and I understand that the people who have come along to this session um that you have very different levels of understanding and awareness around trans and gender diverse inclusion so today we're going to talk 
um, probably a bit more deeply based on the questions that you've sent through because they were excellent, sophisticated questions that came through. But I also want to make sure that we bring everybody with us on this conversation. So I'm not going to talk about trans and gender diverse 101 as such, um, but absolutely in the chat, if I'm talking about concepts you're not familiar with, using language, please um, let us know and we'll address that. Um, so I use they, them pronouns. You will sometimes get that wrong and that's okay. I think this is one of the, the key learning things is that we have to be comfortable making mistakes or we can't create inclusion. Um, and I don't care whether we're talking about trans and gender diverse inclusion or we're talking about the inclusion of neurodivergent folks or whether we're talking about inclusion of, of people of colour, we have to be prepared to make mistakes. Rather than getting defensive, kind of thinking I can't, you know, oh, now I can't say anything in this workplace. And so we don't talk and we don't interact with people. It's the opposite of, of inclusion. We have to be prepared to sometimes get it wrong. If you get it wrong, um, like that woman in that story, um, if you get it wrong, correct yourself and move on. Let's not make huge big deals about it um, because that's where the art discomfort comes when we sit in a conversation for 30 minutes about why you're a great LGBTIQA plus ally um, and all of the things that go along with that conversation, which sometimes are, are 10 times worse than you're getting my pronouns wrong. <laughs> so people kind of start digging a, a bit of a hole. So okay to get it wrong. If you get it wrong, correct yourself and move on. Um, kind of a key um, learning point there. Now I did say I wanted to, um, that we are, oh, there was a couple of other things I just wanted to talk about um, pronouns before we do move on from that. Um, when you get it right, it can be really affirming and welcoming and inclusive and can create a place of safety for someone. So as much as I say it's okay to get it wrong, let's try as much as we can to get it right for people, yeah. Um, for me, if somebody gets it wrong, it's not a big um, triggering moment for me, but it absolutely distracts me from the conversation we're having, from the meeting I might be in, um, from the presentation, the amount of times I go to deliver a presentation and the CEO who introduces me, despite being told three seconds before, make sure you get my pronouns right, absolutely misgenders me. And then I've got to awkwardly talk to the whole group about how the CEO misgendered me and it's okay to make mistakes. Let's do what we can to get it right. Um, because it can, you know, we should absolutely be able to be seen as our identity and referred to um, in the way that makes sense to us. Some people, and a question came through, some people do use she, they, or he, they pronouns. Um, and I can see some people are actually on the call today who have those pronouns. Um, and people say, well, what should I use? And I don't want to talk for others' experiences, um, but what people tell me is that it's about using both, right? You can use both. Um, you can use both. Don't pretend that it's not there and just continue to use the, the pronoun that you were using for that person, perhaps, because it can be really affirming, right, in the same way to use both of those pronouns. Um, it may be for some people that's a transition phase. It was for me. I used she, they initially. I used that to make it easier for the people around me rather than necessarily I wanted she, her pronouns. It was that I felt that it was too much to ask people to change uh, the way that they referred to me and that that was going to make it a much more difficult conversation to have with people. Kind of used it as this gradual um touching you know toes in the water type experience but for some people they will use she they pronouns or he they pronouns for their entire life um, so everybody's experience is different um, but what I wanted to do is just kind of talk about or have a little reminder for us and a refresher um, about some of the terms that we might use today we're talking about trans and gender diverse inclusion that includes non-binary folks um, the trans, it's a trans umbrella, right, of people who are not only um, non-binary, but also who might be gender queer, gender fluid. There's a whole range of gender identities that fit under that trans umbrella. Um, and let's be really conscious of that because, um, you know, we know, and, and Britt was telling me this morning that when it comes to young people, uh, statistics are sitting somewhere like there's 10% of young people identify as non-binary or gender diverse. Um, so it's a significant portion of people, 
right? Um, and if we just think about trans inclusion in a binary way, um, you know, trans men and trans women, then we are excluding um, a, a bunch of people who also may identify under that umbrella. That's not to say that every person who's non-binary will have an affinity towards that trans term either. Use the terms that people tell you to use for them. Um, that's, that's really important. Um, and gender can be fluid. It wasn't for me, but it seemed that way for everybody else in my life. I think I have known subconsciously from a, a four-year-old that I was non-binary, but I didn't have the language or the understanding for that at all. Um, and I, I don't believe that that has shifted, although my gender expression has shifted quite significantly across my lifetime, um, presenting in a really feminine way and sometimes in a, in a much more masculine way. Um, but for some people, that's not the case. Their, their gender absolutely does um, change and it can change from day to day um, or it can be a more a gradual process throughout their lives. So just being conscious that, that there are people who are gender fluid. Cisgender is not a slur, um, which I know Elon Musk has tried to make it that um, at the moment, but cisgender is the term that refers to people whose sex that they were assigned at birth is matches the gender identity that they have. So that if you were sex assigned at birth female um, and you, uh, are, you are a woman, um, then you would be cisgendered. It's not a slur, it's just a factual term. Um, and if you were sex assigned at birth male um, and now you identify as non-binary, then you might fit yourself under that transgender. Um, umbrella or term. So two, two phrases um, to describe different experiences. It's definitely not anything negative or positive about those words. They are, they are factual. Um, gender affirmation. So some people are not quite familiar with, with that terminology, still thinking around the gender transition uh, terminology. Some people will use the transition terminology for themselves and their own journey, and others will use affirmation in workplaces. Best practice is to use affirmation. So this is where we recognise that a person is affirming their gender in the workplace. It's the process they're undergoing in the workplace to affirm their gender. Um, but most good policies around gender affirmation processes will pr contain both of those terms to make sure we're recognising that some people will refer to it as, as their transition. Um, and that's totally fine too. Um, and I've put inclusion on that slide because I think people have a real uh, misperception around what inclusion is. And I think we need to constantly challenge ourselves on what inclusion looks like. Because for a long time, inclusion was, we're going to open our doors and say everybody is welcome here. Um, that's not inclusion at all because we're opening the doors to the existing systems and structures. Um, and actually what we need to do is create a space that reflects the diversity of all of us um, and creates that accessibility for us and creates a sense of belonging for us all um, rather than just you're welcome here. Um, that's still where the majority and you can come in if you want. It's that this is our place um, and we're gonna build it together. And I think we need to have that kind of mindset when we think of workplaces in terms of challenging the status quo and the norms, because we have built our workplaces on a particular type of worker. And what we're doing is kind of retrofitting it, right, <laughs> to currently um, to recognise that there are a, a diversity of different experience and backgrounds with our employees. But if we can get to that space where we actually redesign it, um, then we're going to be much more likely to create that sense of belonging for others for everyone, not others. Um, so hopefully those, that, those kind of terms make a bit, of, a bit of sense. I know for many of you, this is stuff you know, but I just wanted to make sure we, we touched on that before we got any further. Um, and before we talk specifically about trans and gender diverse inclusion in the workplace, I wanna talk about the gender binary and the way we continue to reinforce that within our workplaces. Because not only does this kind of underlie a lot of the exclusion, the discrimination and harassment that trans and gender diverse folks face. Um, it also underlies the gender equality problem too, um, more broadly, right? This is the kind of stuff that we need to be challenging regularly. Um, so how do we do that? We do that through our conversations. 
um, really reflecting on the conversations that we're having in the workplace and that whether they are reinforcing gender stereotypes. I was in a workplace recently where um, somebody had brought in their toddler um, and the toddler was dressed in this fancy little suit. And another employee made a comment that, that this little toddler was going to melt girls' hearts when he got older. It sounds like really innocuous, right? Um, but what if that kid is gay? Um, what if that child does have a different experience? Um, but not just that, but what message are we sending when we say that if there's somebody who's LGBTIQA plus in the space? They're absolutely noticing that language and we're establishing a norm that it's normal for that kid to grow up straight um, and anything else is, is outside the norm. So I know it sounds a little bit um, picky, but it's not to those who have that experience, right? And so if you can notice when language, when stories are being shared, when language is being used that's reinforcing that kind of heteronormativity, we call it, that, that everybody is, is straight and cisgendered, um, then that's a really positive way we can we can create inclusion and challenge those, those stereotypes and those expectations. Task allocations roles. I was delivering training recently um, to a predominantly male dominated workplace. And there was, I noticed in the groups that they had set themselves up in is that there was one woman in every group around these, these workshops. And when I asked people to enter onto the electronic padlet that we had, it was all the women doing the note taking. Um, and so we paused and we noticed that and we reflected on that and we thought, well, how can we run this workshop going forward to make sure that that doesn't, that's not the norm for the rest of the day. So really challenging the way um, roles are taken on. You know, some people just like taking notes. That was what people always say to me when I raise this. Yeah, some people do, but also there's um, men who like taking notes and there's people of all genders who like taking notes and there's people who don't like taking notes and let's make sure that there's not this kind of expectation because not only as I said is that a, a gender binary issue in terms of allocating those kind of administrative tasks to women but think about a non-binary person in that space what are they meant to do what's expected of them what's the unwritten expectation of their interaction there um, you know, and what are other colleagues going to think about them, depending on how they choose to interact in that space. So just it's it's a little example, but just constantly thinking about how those automatic task allocations occur. I had a worker tell me once, it was an outdoor worker, and he said to me, oh, we've got a woman in our team, which is really great. Um, and we talked a bit about gender equality. And he said, oh, you know, I've just realised that she's the one who goes every Friday to the supermarket to replace the tea bags and the biscuits. I would quite like to do that job and I'm not sure if anybody ever asked her if that was just an expectation. Um, and so they did. They set up a roster from there on in that people got to go into that, that um, supermarket shop. So recognising when those gender stereotypes pop up. Celebrations is, a, is another good one in terms of what type of wrapping paper are we choosing? I got a gift recently for speaking at a session and I ended up with a, um, a plant and it was wrapped in pink tissue paper. <laughs> so it left me wondering, well, what present were they going to give if they had assumed me to be a man? And yet I was actually there to talk about LGBTI inclusion. So that was even more confusing. Um, but thinking about, you know, when those, those little moments of reinforcing the gender stereotype. Um, all right, so let's get into a little bit of some deeper stuff. Um, there was an excellent article published recently um, by Robin Ladwig, and I've got the link down the bottom there. It was titled Managerial Influences on the Inclusion of Transgender and Gender Diverse Employees. But what Robin did was interview a bunch of trans and gender diverse employees and kind of work out what it is that they needed to feel included. And some really, I guess, much more complex things came out than what we typically think of when we think of we've got to get pronouns right and we need to have some pride flags around. Um, there was a, a lot more um, complexity around what actually made trans and gender diverse folks feel like they were genuinely included in a workplace. 
One of the key things was people feeling safe to speak up and challenge gender binaries. Um, now, this is really interesting because it's not just that gender binaries don't exist, because they clearly do, but it's that people feel safe to challenge it and they're not going to be faced by that kind of pushback um, and that, that defensiveness. I was training a workshop and this one manager told me a story about how they were trying to tackle the use of microaggressions in their team. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, microaggressions might be well-intentioned comments that actually land in a sexist, racist, ableist, um, transphobic way. So that do actually hurt others. Um, and they were really focusing on this in their team. And what they had introduced was a rubber chicken. And the rubber chicken sat in the workplace and every time um, somebody said something that was perceived to be a microaggression by another team member, people would rush to squeak the rubber chicken. And when the rubber chicken was squeaked, everybody stopped and paused and they talked about what had been said and why it wasn't okay. Now that's not gonna work in every workplace, right? That's a high trust workplace where people feel comfortable to be challenged on their language. Um, we, I think that's the goal. <laughs> to create a workplace where people do feel safe to get things wrong, as I mentioned right at the beginning, and where others therefore feel empowered to challenge the language that we're using, the behaviours that we're enacting, the way the, the thoughts and perspectives we're bringing into projects perhaps. Um, to be genuinely be able to challenge biases, challenge stereotypes, um, and not have people feel like they're being attacked or need to get defensive. That's absolutely the creation of, of psychological safety, right? So it's no surprise that this is one of the key findings. Supportive, active leadership and team member exchanges that encourage a sympathetic climate. I don't love the word sympathy, but I understand what they're talking about here in that, um, you know, we need leadership that not only says that trans and gender diverse folks are fine, we actually need leadership that actively creates inclusion on a daily basis that is prepared to take action to create that. And I know one of the questions that came through was around how do we do that? How do we get our leaders um, to be as interested in this stuff as perhaps those of us who um, experience exclusion are interested in it or those who have passion in creating inclusion? And that's, you know, that's kind of like the biggest question, <laughs> right? in terms of how do we do that? And there's no kind of simple way to create that. We know we have to get diverse leadership. We know our leadership has to be diverse. We know we have to value inclusive leadership skills in our recruitment processes, which still so few organisations are actually doing. Um, that, is, that is super important. Um, we also know that we have to engage give the time with our leaders for them to build their awareness and understanding. The majority of leaders that I speak to who aren't doing anything in this space, it's because they're too afraid to get it wrong. It's not what we think it is that there's just total apathy. It's quite often they're too afraid to kind of step into that space. That's somebody else's job, not theirs. Um, their job is to focus on finance. I'm going to leave that to the people who know something about it. Um, so we have to educate our leaders and, and bring them with us on that kind of path and on that journey. Um, and in some workplaces, yes, we need to put in accountability measures. Um, and doing that can be difficult in a non-authorised environment, but if we can get those accountabilities in, pro in place, then we can start to bring people along a little bit quicker. Um, but that's a conversation <laughs> that's, that's probably much bigger than today's, than today's chat. Um, a rich relationship with their leader based on high trust and support. When I run focus groups with LGBTIQA plus people and they're having a good time, it is 100% because their manager supports them. Like this is, there is no doubt. We know in workplaces in general that um, employees need to have a good direct relationship with their manager. It's no different for trans and gender diverse folks. In fact, it's even more important that they know that they have a safe space to go to with their manager. Um, and so what are we doing to make sure our managers, particularly our managers who we know are managing gender diverse staff, what are we doing to empower them to create that safety? Um, we have to be absolutely hacking that head on, tackling that head on 
um, it is that middle manager band um, that actually can have more influence than the senior executives, believe it or not, because of that importance of that one-on-one -on -one relationship. And the last one there was all gender inclusive team interactions, which is an interesting one on its own. And we might talk about that um, a little bit later. Um, happy to answer any questions that people have if you want to stick them in the chat as we go along. So what gets in the way? Infrastructure absolutely gets in the way. Um, everybody should be able to access a toilet at work. They shouldn't have to not drink for the day um, or run down the street to find a toilet or move down the street to find a toilet. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about bathrooms, but this is a basic necessity, right? And if you don't have some kind of all gender bathroom in your workplace, um, then you're not creating an inclusive space. Can you get around an old building that's set up with just men's and women's bathrooms? Yes, you can. Um, you do need to be innovative. I've also seen organisations that are on the process of trying to create an all gender bathroom um, space, but in the meantime, have some great signs put up in their gendered bathrooms and on the front doors to let people know that it's an individual's job to understand their gender identity and therefore choose which bathroom works for them and that we're not going to police each other on our, on our bathroom usage because that is the problem. Um, it is a, a significant problem that people, trans and gender diverse folks, are acutely aware of when they walk into a bathroom they can face violence, emotional, physical, psychologically, Etc. Let's get all gendered bathrooms. That's kind of like a, a baseline requirement that everybody has access to a bathroom. Data collection. If your recruitment process asks for gender in a binary way, you are not going to get trans and gender diverse folks to come into your organization. You're certainly not setting them up to want to be there. Um, but the interesting thing that um, employees keep telling me is that it's also really important in that recruitment process, whether it's on the position description, whether it's on the job advertisement, or whether it's where you're entering your details, that it's very clear why you're collecting, what data you're collecting, how you're going to use that, and how inclusive your organisation actually is. So there's some government departments that ask for sexuality um, at point of recruitment. And employees say to me, I'm actually happy to provide that if I knew that that wasn't going to impact my chances here in this recruitment process, but I'm going to hold that back if I don't trust that this organisation is inclusive. So making sure that we are sending very visible messages um, around our inclusion, maybe even providing some stats. Employees have told me it'd be great just to know how many queer folk are in this organisation that I'm seeking to enter. Um, that would be really helpful for me because if there's a, a reasonable percentage, then I feel like maybe um, maybe this is a safe space for me. People are looking for signs of safety when they're going through a recruitment process. So as many opportunities as we get to provide that, the better. Um, and have some gender affirmation guidelines. And not having that absolutely gets in the way, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, Psychological safety, yep, the lack thereof, and we've talked about that, um, it gets in the way. Um, Amanda, I love that. Can I mention the accessible bathroom really needs to be safe for people with disability? Absolutely. Um, and that's just the common thing, right? Uh, we change the disability, the disabled toilet into an all gendered toilet. There are other ways we can provide all gender bathrooms. We don't have to take that facility away and some people feel comfortable using that and some people do not because they're taking up the space um, of somebody else who who needs the functionality that's within that bathroom that they don't need so yeah that's a great great call out um sorry there's another one there from jojo one of the things i've noticed on a lot of forms is a man woman other yes yuck um other can sometimes feel really exclusive like people don't understand gender diversity absolutely I hate that other and I hate unspecified like who's unspecified um maybe some people do like that term I think that's that's sort of indeterminate like there's so many different ways people try to collect data about gender if you're not sure what options to put 
put a free text box. Let people talk about their gender in the way that makes sense to them. Um, I understand not all forms can do that, but the reality is most can. Um, but there's some great um, guides out there to help you with the gender options um, to, to put on there. Um, what gets in the way? We talked about supervisor employee relations, non-inclusive social events. Um, absolutely, if those social events are down gender lines um, or perhaps they're at venues that aren't, that don't feel safe or inclusive. I was just at a conference on Friday. Um, I asked one of the staff members there, where were the toilets? She directed me specifically to the women's toilets, which were actually a long way away from the men's toilets and there were no all gender toilets. Um, and so if I'm going to create a venue, if I'm going to choose a venue that we as an organisation are going to go and use, then I need to make sure that that organisation themselves understand gender um, diversity, trans inclusion and have the right facilities um, for people to use. And obviously bathrooms is just one aspect of that. Actually having staff who have a level of awareness around trans inclusion is really important as well. Um, Lack of connection opportunities, LGBTIQ plus um, employees who are getting focus groups with me absolutely say that having some kind of pride network is vital to them feeling safe, supported and included in the workplace. They want to be able to connect with other queer employees in that organisation to share their experiences, to perhaps bandy together if they have a challenge that they want addressed. These are super important. Um, but unfortunately, some orgs know that, so they create pride networks, but they don't create them in a way that the queer employees actually want them. Um, so remembering that, that, uh, that saying, we have to make sure that if we're gonna create something like that, that is actually queer led, it's queer run, and it's queer designed, so that LGBTIQA folks are involved in the design of that. Um, particularly also, we know that there is a huge overlap between neurodivergence and trans and gender diverse, diverse folks. So if we think about the intersectionality of that and the compounding factors, we can create, we can have straight cisgendered people create a pride network and some pride events that are totally non-inclusive for those who are actually wanting to access that. Um, so we want all of those voices to be able to create the network in the way that actually delivers on what they want from it. And believe me, in each organization, organization, it's very different what the employees want from those pride networks. Um, so ask them the question specifically. Um, one of the big things that people talk to me about regularly is not having role models, not having visible um, LGBTIQA plus employees, particularly in leadership roles, but also not having active allies in leadership roles. Um, so Encouraging your leaders or yourselves to introduce yourself with your pronouns is one great way to start, right? That's an active demonstration of allyship from the beginning. Um, even though some people might find that a little bit uncomfortable, they'll get used to it. Um, and it sends such a strong message of inclusion off the bat. So just getting people to, to be active allies in leadership roles or if you've got um, queer folks in leadership roles, not forcing them to be out, obviously, and they shouldn't have to carry the emotional load of that all the time. Um, but if they are comfortable to creating space for that visibility. Um, and assumptions get in the way. Dress codes, I hate dress codes. Teresa, who's on the call, is with me on this. We've been commenting on some, we've been doing some policy reviews and commenting on how um, frustrating it is reading dress codes. People have to dress professional and that their managers get to decide whether they're professional or not. This is absolutely goes against all of the inclusion principles. Um, I understand some workplaces need dress codes, but if you are going to do that, make sure it is a gender diverse inclusive dress code and not just gender diverse. Let's talk about cultural inclusion um, because so many times those dress codes are really create multiple barriers for people from a range of different cultural backgrounds. Um, and, you know, we can add disability in there as well. There's some really, some barriers that get placed, put in place from that perspective as well. Um, let's move on. I know we're getting a bit short on time. I've missed some of the things in the, in the chat there. So um, I'll jump to them in a second. I just want to jump to the what can we do. 
um, before we do wrap up and I hand it over for questions. Talked about a lot of the barriers. I talked about some of the things you can do, but there's there's a few others. A question came through about how to how to write gender inclusive language, how to use gender inclusive language. Um, there's sometimes this misperception that trans and gender diverse folks want gender to somehow disappear. You know, all those memes about um, not being able to use the word woman anymore. Um, that's not necessarily the case at all. I'm mean, sure there's some people who perhaps share those thoughts, um, but the majority of transgender diverse folks, gender is actually really important to us. It shaped a lot of our lives, right? Probably more so than, than for cisgendered folks. Um, it's about making sure we include all. So if we're not going to use language like man and women and men and women and not recognise that there are people who don't identify within those two genders. Um, and I get a lot of pushback in the gender equality space around this, um, but I think it's really important that whenever we're using language to describe genders, that we recognise that there are people who don't identify as men or women. Um, I'm doing a course currently and the reading materials are just littered with she, he, she slash he. Just use they for goodness sake. That's not eliminating gender. Um, that's actually proper use of grammar um, when we're writing. It's like people are inserting gender in, into things, trying to avoid things like ladies and gentlemen. Um, we can use folks, we can use team, we can use everyone. Um, lots of different ways that we can be inclusive with our language rather than seeking to us to re-establish or to, I, I guess, maintain that gendered norm that there's only men and women. We talked about all gender bathrooms, talked about inclusive signs, and we've talked a lot about pronouns. Do not do a pronoun round with your team. Do not make it compulsory for people to put pronouns on their email signatures. Um, they have to be opt-in things. Don't assume that people feel safe to come out, basically. Um, we don't want to force people to come out by putting their pronouns on their signatures um, or on their Zoom names, um, but we want to create the option and the space for it, and we want to strongly encourage our leaders to take that option up because that sends a message from the top that absolutely we recognise that gender is not binary. Um, so I think that's super important. We talked about being relational, so we talked about support networks. Um, training that's not just one-off training. We need to be having regular conversations to raise people's understanding and awareness of the experiences of not just trans and gender diverse folks, but around diversity, equity, and inclusion more broadly. These need to be regular conversations we're having in the workplace. Um, and policies. We do have um, a gender affirmation process and policy template um, that we will provide to organisations and help them implement that in their workplace. But there's also a bunch of free ones you can get off the web too. Um, so a simple thing to put in place because don't let the first trans person that comes up and says they want to affirm their gender in the workplace be that kind of guinea pig, you know, that everything gets tested on. Um, and that they have a really rotten experience, but maybe the next one has a better experience. Let's just get those policies and processes in place first so that we know how to respond. Because I'm kind of sick of getting um, appointments in my calendar with people telling me that somebody has just come out as trans in their workplace and they're not quite sure what to do about that. Have that conversation beforehand because somebody is absolutely going to be trans or gender diverse in your workplace or is already. Um, so let's get in front of that. Um, flexibility of work location, I've talked about it in other spheres around my ideas around hybrid working and how um, non-inclusive that is, the way that that is being applied rigidly. This impacts people from underrepresented and marginalised groups who perhaps don't feel safe in the workplace. Um, let's have flexible ways of working while we try to create that safety for people to come in. Um, some people want to come into the workplace, some people don't. Let's be flexible with that application. And harassment and discrimination policies, of course. Um, so let me stop that share um, and let's go through the chat. Britt, is there things, what have I missed in the chat that we should talk about? And please put any questions in there that you might have. I'm um, just talking about forms and um, having that and um, 
when a job ad says that it's for people who identify as a woman only and how that might be exclusionary to other people that could uh, bring something to that role. I like the one and I get asked that a lot in terms of not just recruitment, but if you think about all the organisations that are running women in leadership programs, um, for starters, I don't think that we should be running women in leadership programs. I think that sends a message that the women need fixing um, when perhaps it's our systems that aren't recognising the leadership skills that women already have. Um, and non-binary folks, I think we should run leadership programs for sure, um, but I don't think that they should necessarily have that kind of gendered lens. But if you are running something or you are running a recruitment process that is specifically for women, I would challenge you to think about um, why wouldn't it also be for gender diverse folks? Because gender diverse folks uh, do face um, more significant barriers to employment um, than cisgendered women, of course, recognising that there are intersectional experiences. So there are women from a whole range of different experiences and identities who do face um, added barriers that, that go beyond gender. So we should be recognising that in those recruitment rounds as well. Um, but if you're running something specifically for women, I'm not sure why it wouldn't also include gender diverse folks and particularly trans women um, who need to be reminded that this space is safe for them too, if it is, of course, safe for them too. Um, so, yeah, that would be my thoughts around that. Now, I'm happy for anyone to unmute themselves. What I might do is I might wrap up the webinar now and stop the recording um, and then we can have a conversation for those who actually want to unmute and talk to. Um, thanks to those of you who are watching the recording and thanks for registering. It's just so humbling to see um, that people have such an interest in this topic. Um, you can find out more about us um, at www.bregorman.com.